Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're gonna to talk about the fail-safe features in our Horner all-in-one controllers. Uh, final reminder, feel free to ask questions at any point. There's a question section in the control panel. You can type those in and we'll do our best to get those questions answered at the end. Okay, here's our agenda for today. What is fail-safe? We're gonna cover OCS memory architecture because if you have a better understanding of how OCS memory is organized and how it works, you'll have a better understanding of how fail-safe can work. We're gonna talk specifically about two important fail-safe features, one called backup and restore. That's probably the most important one. So if you take nothing else from this uh, presentation today, definitely pay attention to backup and restore. Auto load also provides some useful features or useful capabilities, although they don't come into play quite as often as backup and restore could. We're also gonna talk a little bit about cloning. Cloning is not directly a fail-safe feature, but it is related and it's also very useful and I thought it made sense to talk about it during today's program. And then as always, we will have questions and answers at the end. All right, let's talk about fail-safe features. Okay, what are fail-safe features? Uh, they're a set of features designed to keep machines running, designed to avoid disruptive program loss and memory loss. Now, the most common issues that a machine could run into over the life um, of the machine, the most common issue would probably be a battery issues. Batteries have limited capacity, limited life. They can be impacted by temperatures. Uh, they can be fickle components sometimes. and by far the most likely scenario for any machine in terms of running into an issue down the road where fail-safe can help, uh, battery issues would be the most common problems you could run into. It's also possible to have things like memory corruption, but in these days, in 2020 in electronics, those are much more rare. Now, the longer that your equipment stays in the field, the longer a machine is deployed, the more important the fail-safe features are. Why is that? Well, for one, because of limited lifetimes, uh, the batteries certainly become uh, lower in capacity over time or more uh, prone to fail. And two, more time passes between the time that the engineer who deployed the machine uh, does the deployment and the time when you know the machine potentially would need to be worked on. So uh, when time passes, we forget things, documentation changes, whatever the case may be. So Again, uh, fail-safe features are important, especially years down the road uh, when you may run into some problems that, that can be uh, recovered from uh, if fail-safe is utilized. All right, let's start with OCS memory and how it's organized. Because again, by understanding the memory organization, it's gonna really help you understand how fail-safe works and why it's important. Okay, there's two main types of memory in, in the OCS all-in-one controllers. And again, OCS stands for Operator Control Station. It's just our product name for our family of all-in-one controllers. And all-in-one controllers, for all intents and purposes, are PLC-like products that have operator interface, networking, and I.O. capability all built into a single package, all with a single software package for programming. Okay, but whether you're talking about a PLC or you're talking about one of our OCS all-in-one controllers, there's two main types of memory we need to talk about. First is RAM. So this is fast memory that is typically used for variables or registers, okay? Um, typically, it must be powered to retain that data. Some of the advantages of RAM besides speed are the fact that it doesn't typically wear out due to excessive write cycles, okay? So that's the definite advantage of RAM. And keep in mind, the variables in a uh, application program running on the floor that is being scanned every few milliseconds, those variables could be changing millisecond by millisecond, so that RAM is gonna get written to an awfully lot. The second type of memory is flash. So this is memory that is non-volatile. In other words, it does not require power to maintain memory. Um, and it's not as fast, however, and it does have the propensity to wear out if it's continuously written to. So with flash, 
Again, the advantage is power down, you don't lose anything. However, you can't continuously write to it, it's not as fast, and it can wear out over time. So those are the two main types of memory um, in a PLC or an OCS. All right, now over the years, and keep in mind, our first all-in-one controller shipped in 1998, so that was well over 20 years ago. Over the years, we have designed products with multiple different architectures when it comes to memory organization. Um, so let's talk first about what we would call our traditional architecture, which is also very similar to the way a lot of PLCs have traditionally worked as well. Now, with the traditional approach, you have what's called battery-backed RAM for variables. Um, and effectively with battery-backed RAM, that's where all your variables are kept. Uh, it's, it's RAM, so it can be written to quite rapidly, um, but it's battery-backed RAM so that when power is removed from the machine, that RAM chip still maintains power. So that's a big advantage uh, with, with battery-backed RAM is that, again, it's fast, but it retains its memory. Um, the disadvantage is it takes a battery to maintain that power uh, or maintain the values when power is removed. And over time, the more time that a machine is powered down, uh, the less capacity or the less life remaining that that battery will have. So that's the, the disadvantage to that approach. Now with the traditional architecture, flash is where the application program is traditionally stored. And it does take a pretty good size battery uh, to keep that RAM alive over the life of the machine or over a several year period, considering that it'll be powered down from time to time. Now, in the case of the traditional architecture, was as it relates to the Horner all-in-one controllers, typically if you lose your battery and you don't do anything uh, as a preventative measure, you don't utilize any of the fail-safe features, you're gonna lose your variables, your program, and your time and date's gonna go back to 1996 or something. So it can be a catastrophic event if you lose your battery and you don't take advantage of fail-safe. The types of products that utilize traditional architecture are gonna be the XLE and XLT and their new ethernet versions, uh, the entire micro series except for the X5, we'll talk about that product a little bit later. And then the new XL Plus 15, even though it's a brand new product, um, we thought that the traditional architecture was the right approach for that product. So one of the advantages of this approach with the traditional architecture is that it's relatively inexpensive um, so you tend to see that in the lower cost products, that approach. The next architecture that's out there with Horner all-in-one controllers is what we call our rechargeable battery architecture. So this is a little bit different, okay? Why did we ever start utilizing an architecture with battery backed, I'm sorry, with rechargeable batteries? Well, mainly because 10 and 15 years ago uh, and even more recent times, more and more microprocessors were designed around mobile devices such as phones, iPods, etc., which ran from rechargeable batteries. So they, those CPUs were really designed to use rechargeable batteries. So as those CPUs became attractive for use in automation applications such as with the OCS, we started using them and then we also started using them with rechargeable batteries. Now in this scenario, uh, RAM is where variables are, are written to at runtime. So the entire time the unit's powered up, uh, RAM is where variables are held. You also have some checksums that are maintained in there for memory integrity. Um, and flash is where the application storage is handled, okay? However, when power is removed from the system, okay, the power management chip on board will detect that power has been removed and it will allow the system to run off of battery for a short period of time. So a reduced subset of the entire system runs and effectively what that system does is the CPU is powered up long enough to effectively copy the current values of all the registers and variables from RAM into flash. And then once that's complete, the power down is, is then finished. So it's effectively a power down procedure. And this can take around 100 milliseconds to happen. So that's how rechargeable batteries vary in terms of the fact that RAM is where variables are housed, but flash 
is where the last value of those variables is housed while the system is powered down. And then at power up, things just happen in reverse. The last value of each variable is copied from flash into RAM and the system picks up and goes. So this is the rechargeable battery architecture for Horner OCS. And you'll find this in a lot of our mainstream products, such as the XL4, XL7, EXL6, and EXLW, and the EXL10. Now, one subtle difference here, with the traditional architecture, when you lose a battery and you don't do anything to you know, alleviate that, your variables are all gonna get reset for all intents and purposes back to zeros. With this architecture, if you don't do any preventative measures and you lose your battery, your variables are gonna to revert to the last stored value on the last successful power down, okay? Now, that's a little different, obviously, than what happens with the traditional architecture. The third architecture is what we're calling our next generation architecture, and that's where we're using some new technology RAM chips uh, to handle the variables. This new technology RAM is actually retentive, okay? And there are a couple different types that are out there. Um, FRAM is one. Now, it has some limitations in terms of its speed and its capacity, and so we've only used FRAM really on one product so far. And then there's also something called MRAM, uh, which is magnetoresistive RAM, and while that's a little bit more expensive, it doesn't have the speed and the capacity limitations that FRAM has. And it has the huge advantage of not requiring a battery to maintain register values. So moving forward, as we release new products, you will see MRAM being used. And the real beauty there is now the only function for a battery is a very small coin cell to maintain the calendar clock. That's all. And if that battery were to fail 10 years from now, um, the only thing you lose is the current time and date. So that's a real advantage, and that is something that we will be using uh, with most of the future products you'll see us release um, as time goes on. Now, I will mention one thing, and that is I talked briefly about FRAM, which is a type of retentive RAM that is limited in capacity and speed. We've actually used that with the X5, so that's what the X5 uses for its variables. And if you ever take a look at the spec sheet of an X5 versus an XL4, for instance, even though they have a very similar processor, because the X5 uses FRAM, the X5 has a much more limited, um, a much more limited register uh, complement. So whereas the XL4 supports 50,000 general purpose registers, the X5 supports 5,000 general purpose registers. And that's mainly because the X5 utilizes FRAM. Okay, so those are the three different architectures. Traditional architecture, battery-backed architecture, and next-generation architecture. All right, now that we understand kind of what the function of the memory is and how each piece fits together, let's talk a little bit about, or extensively really, about fail-safe features. And the first one we're gonna cover is backup and restore. And it's really the most important one because it can, in the case of a battery issue, it can really save your bacon. Okay, and that battery issue could happen seven to 10 years from now after you deploy the system. And at that point, you might be retired or you know, who knows what, is, what, what has happened over that uh, passage of time. A beauty of the backup and restore feature is that it does not require a memory card. That's a misconception. You can take advantage of backup and restore and you don't need a memory card. Okay, what does backup and restore do? Well, it copies some important information to a safe location in Flash. So when you perform a backup, it copies the checksum for the OCS application program, um, it copies all the variables and register values, and it copies all the OCS system settings, all the things you might set from the system menu, you know, baud rates and, uh, you know, uh, RS-45 terminations and all those sorts of things. It takes all that information and it stores it away in a safe location in Flash where it can be retrieved later if and when it's needed. Now it's enabled fully from the system menu, although you also have the option of utilizing system registers to enable the feature. Again, it's most commonly useful because of future battery issues that can occur with machines. Um, and it doesn't protect against flash corruption. We have other ways of taking care of that, but keep in mind flash corruption is really rare. So again, the most common things that can occur to a machine, backup and restore are gonna take care of those. 
Okay, I'm going to show you through a demonstration how to set these up in Excel 4 as a good example. So I'm not going to cover this in huge detail on the PowerPoint slides here. But in general, you want to get the system running as it's ready to deploy. Um, everything's in a good state. You're going to set a couple parameters in the system menu on, perform a backup, um, and then uh, you're ready to go. You can deploy the machine, and then if you ever have an issue in the future, you can recover in a fairly elegant way from a battery failure, for instance. Now, in the case of one of our traditional controllers, uh, such as the XLE or XLT or the Micro Series, if you have a battery issue in the future and you've utilized backup and restore, it can really save you because effectively it's going to keep your program from being erased and it's also going to maintain a good set of register values that you can con continue to run on until the point where you can actually change out your battery to get your calendar clock back. Okay, so it's really important with traditional controllers because of the fact you'll, you'll, you'll lose your program um, if, if your battery fails and you didn't take advantage of this. With rechargeable architecture, there's a lot of advantages as well, although with the rechargeable architecture, we don't erase the program uh, or the program isn't lost in the case of uh, losing the battery, for instance. So you will have uh, issues with uh, variables and registers and those sorts of things, but you won't lose your program. But it's still valuable to take advantage of it, even with the rechargeable architecture. Now, if you don't utilize these features, again, what's going to happen with traditional architecture? The main thing is you're going to lose your program. All your variables are going to reset to zero effectively, and you're going to have the dreaded no user screens to display message on the unit, and you're going to get a phone call. Um, with a rechargeable architecture, the main difference is the system is going to revert to older registers. Um, you're going to lose your calendar clock, but you won't lose your program. That at least is the case. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and show you how to set up backup and restore. Okay, let's start looking at our fail-safe features, starting with the most important one, and that is backup and restore. Now, backup and restore will help you recover from a battery issue. And all PLCs and all-in-one controllers have batteries that perform some uh, important function. And usually, uh, when they fail, uh, if not properly handled, can cause an interruption to the system. So, backup and restore is a feature that will help you recover as best as possible from a battery issue. Another important thing to know about Backup and Restore is you do not need a memory card. No memory card is required. We can do it all from the system menu. Now, we want to start from a point at which the program is running the way we want. We have all of our system settings. Everything we would normally set from the system menu is set the way we want as well. And we're running the application program that we want with the variables all with the proper value. Okay, so that's our starting point. Let's go to the system menu, go to fail safe, and start by enabling auto run. Auto run means that if we ever have to recover using fail safe, we are going to recover and then go into run mode automatically, which is typically what we want. The next step is to perform a backup, which we do here from backup and restore data. What does a backup do? Well, it takes a copy of the checksum for the current application program, plus a copy of all the current system settings, all the things that we set from the system menu, et cetera, and a copy of the current values of all the variables and registers in the program, and store all that to a safe area of flash. And then if we ever have a battery problem in the future, we can recover from that by loading in this known set of good data. Now, it won't be the latest data because maybe the system ran for years, okay, but it will load in uh, a good set of known data, allowing the system to recover until the battery can be replaced um, and the system can be fully brought up to 100%. But at least your program will be running with a known good set of data. Okay, so now that we've performed these steps, of enabling auto run and performing a backup. Now we're ready if we ever have a battery issue. 
So the next step is I'm going to go ahead and take out the battery. Now we're going to illustrate how backup and restore can help you recover as good as possible in the future if you have a battery failure. Okay, so this unit uh, does not have a battery in it. That's how we're simulating the failure. Uh, we've made some adjustments to our parameters. They're not exactly the same as they were when we uh, first started running the unit. Okay, let's go ahead and perform a power cycle with a bad battery or a missing battery. And let's see what happens. Okay, we're powering up. We should get a battery error. Self-test, battery voltage problem, self-test failed. However, we did recover, okay? You'll notice that these values are not exactly the same as when I powered down, but they do match the values when I performed the backup. And if I go to the system menu, you'll see the OK light is off. Well, why is the OK light off? Because we have a bad battery. But we are in run mode and we are operating. The other thing that has happened without a battery is our calendar clock is not able to keep current time. So if we take a look at time and date, we'll notice that we've gone back to the default time and date of January 1 of 1996. And every time we power cycle, we're going to go back to that date. Okay, so it's not perfect. However, the system is running using a known good set of values, and we have recovered. Now we can fix the battery, set the clock, and fully recover with some human intervention. Okay, so that is backup and restore. Uh, important feature. Uh, to keep the system running in case the battery were to fail several years from now, for instance. Okay, the next fail safe feature we're going to talk about is auto load. So, auto load is a feature which protects against issues in flash, uh, flash corruption, which is, you know, rare, um, or it also can protect against accidental program deletion. You know, maybe there's a Homer Simpson moment where somehow from Seascape, somebody accidentally deletes the program and there's no backup copy, um, or probably more uh, commonly, a failed or aborted download, where you start downloading a program to an OCS, it gets interrupted for whatever reason, and now there's no valid program running in the controller. Now, auto load does require a memory card, but memory cards are cheap these days, and you can utilize great features such as data logging, for instance, so get a memory card. Um, and when is auto load invoked? Well, it's invoked when the OCS powers up and while the, the um, battery test passes and the, the RAM tests pass, um, there's just no application program running or no valid application program at all in the unit. So in that scenario, um, auto load will effectively look for a program called autoload.pgm on the memory card. If it's there, it'll load it and it'll run, okay? And this feature can be enabled from the system menu, just like backup and restore, or from system registers. Now, the steps required for setup are extremely simple. Uh, there's a couple parameters to turn on in the system menu, and effectively, you're done. Okay, so nothing to it, although we will show you how to do that with a video. Now, what happens if you've enabled auto load with a traditional or battery backed architecture for that matter, really any of our products? Well, if the OCS powers up and the battery's fine, RAM's fine, however, again, no valid program, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look for auto load.pgm, load it, and run it. Now, keep in mind there's no battery or RAM problem, so the calendar clock's going to continue on because it doesn't have an issue and all the variables should be fine also because they shouldn't have been lost either. So anyway, that's what's going to happen if you've enabled auto load. And if you haven't enabled auto load, effectively, if your OCS ever powers up without a valid application program, it's just going to sit there until somebody comes on site and takes care of it. Okay, so um, that's what's going to happen. So obviously, uh, that's not not desired. Okay, let's go ahead and walk through the process of enabling and demonstrating auto load. 
Now let's go ahead and demonstrate another fail-safe feature called auto load. Now I will say that backup and restore, which we previously showed you, is by far the most important of the fail-safe features. However, auto load does have some utility in that it will protect you from a scenario in which you lose your program for a reason such as um, having an aborted download, maybe a remote, a remote download attempt over the internet went bad and halfway through the download, you lost your cell connection for your cell modem and suddenly you don't have a valid program in the controller. So auto load would allow you to recover at the next power cycle by automatically loading a known good program um, at that time. So that's really the main utility for auto load. The other time that you might lose your program would be very rare, and that is just with a, let's say, a corrupted flash that might be caused by just some huge electrical noise or something. But again, I don't know if I've ever even heard of that happening or not. Um, flash these days is pretty reliable. Okay, let's show how we set up auto load. Once again, we have to go to the system menu. All right, we've got our application set up the way we want. Um, now, auto load, unlike backup and restore, does require a removable media card. So we've got one here, it just happens to be empty. Okay, so we do have to have a removable media card. The next step is to go back to fail safe menu and make sure that auto load is enabled. We'll set that to yes. And after we load the program automatically, we are also going to want it to go into run automatically as well. So I'll set yes there also. Okay, so now we have made sure we have a memory card and made sure that auto load and auto run are both set to yes. Now, when we automatically load this program, if that eventuality ever happens, we have to have a program to load and that program has to be named autoload.pgm. Now we could create that file from Seascape using the export to removal memory feature, but the easiest thing to do is from the unit itself, perform a make clone. So I've gone to the clone menu, I'm going to hit make clone, and the process of making a clone is going to create that autoload.pgm file that I need uh, for autoload to work properly. Now we'll also create a clone.dat file, and for the purposes of autoload, that won't be used. Because remember, in our scenario, we don't have a problem with our, uh, with our registers or variables or our system settings. We've got a flash problem. So we aren't going to have to reload system settings and variables or registers. All we need to reload is our program, which has become corrupted or is invalid for whatever reason, most, most likely an aborted download, for instance. Okay, so now we're set up properly. Okay, so now let's go ahead and simulate that failed download. I'm gonna go ahead and go to Seascape here, and I'm gonna go ahead and um, perform a download. Now off screen, in Seascape, I'm starting a download here, so give me a minute to do that. Okay, so the download is starting. Soon you'll see the impact on the screen of the controller. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and interrupt that download. Okay, so this simulates, for instance, maybe you were trying to download to the unit over the internet through a cell modem, you lost your connection to your cell modem and boom, now we've got issues. Okay, so this unit does not have a valid program in it. Now the way that we can recover from that is going to require a power cycle. So it does require a power cycle to recover. So let's go ahead and perform that now. Okay, so I've reapplied power and let's keep an eye on the diagnostic messages. Uh, we have errors. Corrupt user tables. We're initializing our auto load and then run. We're loading from memory card and we have fully recovered. If we go to the system menu, we'll see both OK and run are on. Now, this had nothing to do with the battery. 
So our time and date and all that sort of thing is still just fine. Okay. So again, this illustrates auto load whose main goal is to restore a valid known program should the unit ever power up with corrupted flash or with an invalid program, maybe because of a aborted download. Okay, so that is auto load. All right, so really what you wanna do, especially if you've got a memory card, is you wanna just go ahead and set, set both of them up. So don't just use one or the other, use them both. If you have a memory card, because that's required for auto load, just use them both. So in this next quick demonstration, I'll show you how the proper steps to take to set them both up. Again, you'll need a memory card, uh, but this will give you both backup and restore and auto load capability. Okay, now that we've shown you individually how both backup and restore and auto load work, Let's go ahead and go through the process from start to finish for enabling everything. Okay, so we've got the application where we want it. The program we want is loaded in the unit. We've got all the settings the way we want them, uh, register values, you name it. Okay, we'll start from the system menu. We're going to go ahead and go to the fail safe menu. We're gonna start by enabling auto load. Now we're gonna enable auto run. So as we recover, we will automatically go into run mode and then we're gonna perform a backup. Okay. Now in order for auto load to work, we need to make sure that we have a memory card installed and a autoload.pgm file. Keep in mind, if we don't have a memory card, we can still use backup and restore, which will protect us from a battery issue, which is very valuable. But if we do have a memory card, we might as well go the rest of the way and make sure that autoload works as well. So the easiest way to make sure autoload.pgm exists is at this stage, Let's go ahead and make a clone because the system is just the way we want it. Okay, we're done. So in probably less than a minute, we protected the unit against battery failure, against some strange loss of program because maybe of an aborted download or some, uh, some flash corruption issue. But anyway, uh, some eventuality that could occur several years from now, uh, we're protected by enabling these fail-safe features. Okay, so that's a rundown of how to use backup and restore and as well as auto load. Now, in my demonstrations, I showed you how to do it from the system menu, that's by far the most common, but you do have the ability to manipulate system registers uh, to do a lot of these same functions, at least for the setup, for instance. So with backup and restore, you can enable auto run uh, from ladder using a system bit. Uh, you can perform a backup uh, using a system bit, you know, by manipulating that 164.7 bit. Um, so you can do a lot of these features from ladder that you could do from the system menu. Now, one of the advantages of the perform backup bit that you see listed there is that you can actually, over time, you can make newer backups um, so that if you ever lose your battery, you'll revert back to registers which are more recent if you want to do that, if that's important to do that. If you don't just wanna get the machine back to a known default state when it was deployed, if you want a more recent set of variables, for instance, you could reasonably uh, create a backup from ladder every day. You could do that and you wouldn't wear out your flash. However, if you got crazy about it and you try to do it too often, you could impact the life cycle of your flash chips. So, you know, once per day is certainly appropriate. You'd need to be really careful about doing it more than that, for instance. But again, even though I showed you how to do everything from the system menu, you can do it from system bits as well. 
All right, next let's talk a little bit about cloning. Now, as I mentioned before in the intro, cloning is not necessarily a fail-safe feature, uh, although it's related. You saw we performed clone so that autoload could work. Um, but let's talk about cloning because it's really valuable. So cloning specifically is a feature that allows system designers um, to replicate exactly the operational state of one of our all-in-one controllers to an identical unit. So this only works if you're talking unit to unit being identically the same. So XL4 to XL4. It doesn't work XL4 to XL7, for instance. Um, but if you want to clone, you know, you're an OEM, you're doing production, you're shipping units out every week, you've got a golden sample on your machine, uh, you make a clone on the golden sample, and then you take that file set, that memory card that's got autoload.pgm and clone.dat. You take those two files on a memory card and then you put them in blank units and load clone uh, and basically replicate that same golden unit as you ship units out the door. So that's really valuable from a production standpoint. It also can be valuable if you've got that clone uh, file set, you know, autoload.pgm and clone.dat. If you've got that on the memory card and you ever have to replace a controller for whatever reason, you can pop that memory card out put the pop it in the new controller and at least get back to the same point you were at when the clone was created with that new controller so that's really valuable as well okay and also just to keep in mind if you do have security enabled uh, in Seascape to protect your intellectual property in other words you know you don't want uh, somebody out there copying the program and putting it in another unit uh, and trying to kind of steal your intellectual property that's not a problem um, when you go to load a clone, if there's a password in there, it's gonna ask for it. So nobody unauthorized is gonna be able to load a clone, again, without the appropriate uh, authority. And once again, you can do cloning from system registers, even though that's a little less common, it's still possible. Um, there are system bits available uh, for that function. Okay. So that is our presentation for today. Let's get into questions and answers here. Let's see what questions we might have. Okay, could you create a warning? This is kind of a suggestion. Could you create a warning in Ladder to warn a user to replace the flash after so many writes as sort of a maintenance feature? Uh, in theory, it could be. It could be done that way. Um, but keep in mind, you know, the the flash chip is a um, you know, it's a really small chip that's soldered on the circuit board, not really designed to be replaced. So really the better approach is probably just not to wear the flash out. And again, as long as you're not going to be performing a backup, you know, every hour in the machine life, you're probably going to be fine. Uh, but that was an interesting suggestion for sure. Okay, let's see if we have any other questions. Let's see. And I might also add, uh, the questions don't have to be limited strictly to the fail-safe features. Any questions in general, I'll be happy to answer those. Okay. Can you display the date and the time of the last known backup? Um, no, there's no way of calling that information up on the screen. That's another good suggestion, but there's no way to do that. So um, when you... Uh, when you perform a backup, you know, it, it does that, uh, but there's no way of effectively retrieving on the screen or anywhere else when that backup was performed. So that's a good suggestion. That's something we should keep in mind. Okay, another question. Does the OCS have memory for recovering graphs and alarm manager in a power cycle and program download? Let me see here. Um, let's see, does it have memory for recovering graphs? and the alarm manager. Okay, it currently does not. Okay, so, um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. For alarm manager, you do have the ability within the alarm manager to configure a log file. Okay, so you can configure, uh, if you go to the graphics editor and you go to the config menu and you go to config alarms, one of the features when you set up alarms as a feature is the ability to set a log file. And that log file effectively records everything that happens 
to a file that can be pulled into a spreadsheet or something like that to see you know what's what happened from an alarm history standpoint so you can do that for sure okay um, and then in the standpoint of of graphs like if you're talking trends for instance there are historical trends where you can also set those up to record to a memory card to a csv file so you do have the ability with alarms and with trends to record the data to memory card for retrieval later, but it's not part of the fail safe feature set where it's automatically gonna recover and pull that information up. Uh, but that information certainly won't be lost because it's contained on files on the memory card. Let's see, what's the best way to copy a program from one controller to another, but they are not the same one? So going from an XL7 to an EXL10, okay. So here's what I would do, and depending on the model, it can get either, it can be either really simple or really complicated. Once again, he's asking about, okay, I've got a program in a XL7 and I wanna move that to an EXL10, for, for instance. Well, let's, say, let's start with the easy approach. Let's say we were moving from an XL4, uh, or let's say we were moving from a EXL6 to an EXL10. The EXL6 and EXL10 actually have the same number of pixels exactly on the screen. So you can literally just change one parameter from an EXL6 file uh, in the hardware configuration, change it from an EXL6 to an EXL10 in hardware configuration and save it as a different file name and you're done. So that's the easiest it can ever be. Now, if it's a controller where the graphics don't match 100%, then it's a little more involved. So the general process would be Okay, so let's take this exact example where he's going from a seven inch to a 10 inch. Okay, so what, what I would do, now this is a little bit odd, but the XL7 actually has higher resolution than the EXL10 does. The EXL10 physically has a bigger screen, but it has less pixels. I know that seems counterintuitive, but it does. Um, anyway, so what I would do is, um, I would actually um, start with the XL7 program, load it in Seascape, and then I would save it, I would go into, the, I would save it as under a new file name, okay, so I don't wanna lose my original file name, and then I would actually go in and change the hardware configuration. Um, uh, if you say we're going to a 10 inch and it's gonna be smaller, okay. So what I would wanna do actually is before I change the hardware configuration from a seven inch to a 10 inch, I would want to shrink the screens down or the graphics on the screens um, from their full 800 by 480 size down to a smaller size that would fit within 640 by 480. So first load the XL7 program, save it under a new name, and then go in and edit the graphics to get the graphics so it fits all within 640 by 480. So that strip of extra pixels on the right that the XL7 has, we need to we need to make sure those are empty. Once I've done that, then I would go ahead into the hardware configuration and change from an XL7 to an EXL10, and then I would go back and tweak as needed on the screens. So that's it's, again, it's not super simple, but that's the approach. If you're going from a smaller screen to a bigger screen, there's some other things you can do. From a smaller screen to a bigger screen, open up the file from the smaller controller save it under new file name, go to the graphics area, and then there's a feature in graphics called expand all screens, something like that. And you can do that, and it'll go ahead and stretch all your screens from the small to the big, and you can see how that does. And if you're, if you're, if you're not going, if the change isn't like from an XLE to an XL Plus, for instance, it might do a pretty good job, and then all you have to do is go in and tweak the screens a little bit, um, and then, you know, and then, then you're off and running. So again, it varies depending on which controller you're going from. Hope that was helpful. Um, okay, so how do backups and clones and firmware versions work? Very good question, outstanding. Are backups from older firmware valid? Are backups from newer firmware loadable into older firmwares? Okay, so you can always go up. So, um, if I have a controller, let's say I've got an XL4, I put it into the field in 2015, okay? And at that time I deployed it, I did a clone, okay? So in 2015, I did a clone. 
Now it's 2020 and for whatever reason, I need to replace that Excel 4 and I still have those clone files from 2010. I can take those clone files, pop them into the new Excel 4 that has way newer firmware than that old unit I'm replacing and I can load it and I should be good to go. You know, if something doesn't work, it's 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 a mistake. It's, it's, it's supposed to work and generally it does. So you can always go from an older clone to a newer firmware version, not a problem. However, if my clone is from 2015 and I try and uh, load it into an older unit from 2010, that's not gonna work, okay? So you can always go up. Generally, you can't go backwards. Great question. Let's see. Can a clone be taken on a local unit, copied to a remote unit via FTP, then loaded on the remote unit? Um, sure it could. Um, of course, you'd need to make sure that the newer unit um, has firmware that's compatible with the unit you did the clone with. So in other words, as long as you're not cop as long as you're copying the unit from this of, of a same age or older, as the clone file, as long as it comes from the same age or older and you load it into a new one over FTP, that can work just fine. Absolutely. Um, and and what's, what's kind of the comment that was made with this question from Connor is, um, this might be a better approach to doing a live download over the internet, um, moving the file over FTP and then loading it that way. Absolutely, it's a better solution if you can do it. If there's a human being Right now, you have to have a human being actually load a clone. I guess you can do it from ladder. Never mind. You can do it from ladder. Um, but anyway, it's a much better solution to take a, a clone file set, move it over the internet to a unit that you want to load, and then invoke a clone. It's much better to do that than it is to you know do a live download where if it fails in the middle, you've got an invalid program in there. So yeah, that's a very good a very good suggestion from Connor. It's actually something we've suggested to customers quite often. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have today. Thanks for um, your attendance, thanks for your time. Um, we'll be announcing soon. I forgot to introduce Marcy. She's been helping me keep the, the Titanic from hitting the iceberg. Um, but Marcy will be sending out an announcement with uh, our October webinars uh, in the next few days. So keep an eye out for that and thanks again for your attendance.